Uh, welcome everyone to this uh, webinar. Very excited to have uh, you all here. Um, as you can see, we're work working on how to save carbon by ex upgrading existing roofs. Um, on our panelists today, we have uh, Scott Squire, who is a technical advisor here at Neuralight. Hi everyone. Dr. Kate, uh, Dr. Kate Meyer, who is a sustainability expert at uh, Becker's and Glenn Bilkey, who is the project architect for the uh, Life Church. Um, just waiting for a couple more people to join the presentation. Okay, um, so I'll just take you through a few things. Um, firstly, um, this is a series of presentations we've been running since lockdown. We're probably up to about the sixth one now. Each presentation we actually um, sponsor a community organization that was working in the sustainability or social field and so this week we're going to be sponsoring uh, planetary accounting network which is uh, kate's organization and kate do you want to just give us a few seconds uh chat about what the organization does uh, yeah, sure. Thanks, John. Um, so Planetary Accounting Network is, um, is a charity that's based in New Zealand, but with a global reach, and it works to take uh, global problems such as climate change, but also um, biodiversity loss, um, land use change, all of the planetary boundaries, and to break them down into manageable chunks so that we can address them um, through our day-to-day -day decisions as individuals, um, as businesses, or as local and, and national governments. Um, so I'm really um, pleased to um, uh, thanks for the support uh, today, John. Great, you're welcome. Um, do you want to just flick on to the next slide, Jade? Um, I think it's really important to just reflect on why we're talking about carbon. Um, Neuralite, we're obviously the flat roof experts, we do membrane roofs. Um, why are we here talking about carbon? Um, well, this chart kind of uh, sums it up. Um, our current projections, according to the United Nations, are uh, planetary warming between three and four percent um, above the average. Um, so that is just a number and you go, oh, it'll be a bit nicer in the summer. But you know, the last time we were four percent off the mean was when we had an ice age. And nobody wants to live in the ice age or the opposite of the ice age. Um, and these time frames are extremely daunting. I mean, this is during my daughter's lifetime. I'm not sure I'm going to see 2,100, but um, to think that the planet is looking on a path to, to be uh, exceeding those outrageous numbers is, uh, yeah, is just uh, unacceptable and we have to act. And so about 18 months ago, Neuralight decided that we had to start doing something, even if we didn't see any of our uh, industry peers doing anything. And so we moved and we went to uh, carbon zero, we changed uh, our behaviors internally. And then as part of that, that gives us a, a mana or authority to start talking about and how our supply chain uses or absorbs carbon. And so for us, it's really about turning, turning the dial um, I'm going to do a quick um, poll now just to um, find out a wee bit about uh, our audience and how much you know about uh, warm roofs in particular. We've done a couple of presentations already on them and so could you just uh, quickly answer whether you uh, are familiar with warm roof systems or if you aren't. We're actually getting a, a large percentage, 75% are actually familiar with warm roofs. Um, so compared with even two or three years ago, that's actually a dramatic change. Um, overseas, the, the default way of doing roofing. Um, okay, let's jump on to uh, Kate now, and she's just gonna give us a couple, run through a couple of slides about her experience. Yeah, thanks, John. Um, so we've been doing some really interesting work at Becker, looking, um, sort of zooming out and, and having a, a New Zealand-wide lens to look at what are the key transitions um, that can help us to rapidly decarbonise um, while we need to create jobs, um, rebuild the economy post-COVID, and then address a number of other challenges such as, um, you know, w warm and healthy homes. Um, and, you know, if you take the breakdown um, as per the... Um, Ministry for the Environment um, emissions breakdown. Building seems like quite a small piece of the puzzle, I think, but even anywhere between two and five percent, depending on 
um, the way you break it down. But actually buildings have such a huge influence on so much more than that. Um, the amount of embodied energy, so the um, carbon emissions and, and energy associated with creating building materials, steel and concrete, um, transporting them to site, actually building the building, and then the end of life emissions are all um, really major components. And obviously buildings are part of a very integrated system. Um, so where we put the buildings and how buildings work really influence transport emissions and, and the way that we use um, cities and, and um, communities. If we jump to the next slide, um, you know, I, I think uh, I was talking uh, at a talk the other day that, that John was in, I was talking about the um, the most sustainable building really is one that we don't build. Um, and, you know, for, for some time now, we've been talking to clients um, to really understand what their real needs are and to look at you know how much of a building do we actually need and it's been really interesting for me this year um, to see how much more of a shift there is going to suddenly be I think in, in the building recycling space you know once we know we have a building there's a lot we can do through passive design to reduce energy demand and things like that but um, but if we can reuse existing buildings we have um, a much lower starting point. So I've just been on a project recently um, that we um, looked at whether we were going to demolish the structure or just do a, a really big um, refurbishment. And um, it, it was a 4,500 tonne difference, which was 90% of the embodied carbon of the structure um, if we kept kept the, um, the existing structure. And, and that has been the outcome for that building. And I think that will be more and more. I don't. Today I don't want to talk too much um, of the, the details and, and the specifics. I'd actually like to tell um, a, a short success story in, a build, in the building recycling space. So if we jump to the next slide, um, this is a story of Aurangi House. Um, so the Aurangi House um, developer um, came came to Becca some years ago and said, "Look, we've we've got this space, but we just can't keep tenants in it. It's so uncomfortable. You know, it's it's too cold or it's too hot. Um, nobody likes to be in it. Um, it's it's leaky uh, and it was they were they re really keen to demolish this building um, and, and to start again with a clean slate and we said you know look uh, we really believe that we can make this building a, a space that you'd like to be in and you know we're willing to be the anchor tenants um, if you engage us to help you with this um, refurbishment um, and so that's what happened um, we went through with them and, and looked at um, what we could do to upgrade this building and so if we go to the next slide the um, this is a, a before and after shot, and um, the space went from something that really um, was very energy intensive and uncomfortable to, to a space that's really lovely to be in. I actually, um, this isn't the Becker office that I usually work in, but I spent two days in it last week, um, and it's just such a, a lovely space to, to be in. Um, and it's actually, they've managed to make it um, uh, naturally ventilated for most of the year so we very rarely have to turn on the heating and cooling systems um, and and it's this lovely space so the what's really interesting to me about this project is this building's performance compared to new buildings because I think a lot of people think oh well you know with a with a refurbishment maybe we can get close but if we go to the next slide um, Oh, <laughs> I've got my slides in a different order. So this slide um, just shows um, that natural ventilation system. So we actually replaced all the glazing in the building with operable windows. And you can see there's high and low level windows and that allows the air to come, come through and then um, exhaust out the top. We added in um, solar shading, but we also put external insulation onto the building so that it's really nice and cozy. Um, so hopefully I've got my slides in the right order that the next one shows us this performance. Um, one more. <laughs> uh, so this shows um, a whole lot of new buildings in New Zealand. And um, so a typical office building in New Zealand gets a three star neighbours rating. So that's this first bar. Um, so that's a sort of a standard new build without any sort of sustainability considerations in, in the design. A lot of buildings perform a lot worse than this. So, um, you know, upwards of sort of 150 kilowatt hours per meter squared is not uncommon. Um, but if you look at all these new builds um, and some of them really um, high performance um, projects, Arangi House is um, performing right up the top there at that 5.5 star rating. Um, so that means its performance is down at the um, sort of 50 to 60 kilowatt hours per meter squared per year. So it's really quite impressive. 
one of the things that um, that we did do to help that is um, uh, um, something called building tuning. So I think one of the other challenges about buildings is, is they are quite complicated. And as you build a building, um, the, the energy profile goes up and up. And it's really important that through maintenance of, of the building and of particularly of the building systems, um, that we manage that. So typically what happens is, is the building performance um, uh, degrades over time and every sort of three to five years um, somebody comes in and gives it a bit of a tweak um, but what we've done in Aurangi House is um, what's called continuous tuning so this is a typical this graph shows typical on the next slide um, we see what what we're doing in this building and so what was great about this building is that when we first um, uh, operated it, it had pretty good performance and then we managed to get a further um, about 20% savings I think it shows on the the next slide. Um, so it started at a four star rating and got all the way down to that five and a half star performance um, through those control strategies. Um, so I guess that's that's all I wanted to share today, but just to really um, drill in the opportunities that there are um, from building recycling. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of savings to be made and um, recycled buildings really can perform as well or better than a lot of new buildings. Thanks, Kate. That's an excellent uh, overview and good to have that case study presented. Um, I've got a couple of questions here and um, anyone else who wants to, there's a Q&A section at the bottom of your Zoom. Most people are familiar now. You can put in a question there and we'll pass them on to the panellists. But um, the question I've got come through is low-hanging fruit. What, what projects do you think are best suited to uh, building renovations? Um. I, I guess there's quite a lot of, um, of of old buildings that really need to um, be brought up to speed where there's um, you know other issues we're finding um, that a lot of people are coming through for example um, with um, seismic um, upgrades that are needed and they're using those seismic upgrades um, as an excuse to do a, a whole building um, upgrade and, and improve the energy efficiency and and change the way that buildings um, are used and I guess there's going to be a lot of um, uh, renovations coming through with different ways of working post post COVID as well. Right. Um, I've got another one. What exterior insulation was used and why was it used on the exterior? Oh, that's a really uh, good test of my memory because uh, this isn't one of my projects. Um, it's. Um, I'm I can really give you happy a hint. to. Uh, I can give oh, you a hint. It was Stowe exterior insulation because it was on your detail. Oh, um, excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, John. Um, yeah. Talk about a soft uh, question. And, and, <laughs> uh, so that worked. Uh, that worked really well. Okay. Um, look, that's great. Um, keep the questions coming through, and um, uh, but we'll move on to the next panelist, and um, that's Glenn, who's going to talk to us about the Life Church project in Mount Eden. Yeah, thanks, John. Um, Life Church um, was the existing premises at the top of Man Eden Road, um, just taken in 2012 for a site for the uh, construction site for the City Railway Link project. And uh, they had to find another site. So um, three years later, they'd uh, actually managed to get the old BIC factory site um, in Nombi Road below Auckland Grammar, which was um, an old uh, industrial building which was built over a period of time between the 60s and the 90s in different stages. You can see it starts uh, on the right hand side there with a the stage one, and then stage two, stage three, stage four at the, on the left hand side, all at different times, but it all um, constructed with steel portal frames, low pitched roofs, one and a half degrees. Um, but we saw the potential um, in this to refurbish because it obviously had reasonable stud heights. Um, we couldn't use the, um, with the auditorium, we had to actually raise the roof because we needed more height. Um, auditorium, which is a 1,750 seat facility. And they also look after children, um, have up to a thousand children on a Sunday uh, cared for in all the different age groups. So uh, 
and plus, you know, big foyers, they've got a gymnasium, um, you've got you know, multi-purpose spaces as well. Um, so it's an ideal, it's a, it's a, it's a big building, um, but the basic bones, because it had industrial portal frames and had a bit of height, uh, was pretty perfect for their use. So um, majority of the building, we, um, we decided early on that a warm roof was the way to go because um, there's quite a lot of um, air handling equipment had to go in. Um, and we had all the new roof penetrations. The existing roof was not in not a very good condition. Uh, it, was a, it was typically a metal tray roof. Um, so we just basically made that decision very early on to um, refurbish, to put a warm roof over it so that the existing roof could remain and the construction could proceed um, you know, w without any weather delays because the process we had in the negotiations with Auckland Transport took about three years and then we had to get a resource consent which was complicated because we had um, the old, old plan and then the unitary plan and we had to actually ended up getting two resource consents so it was, it was quite a complex program so we had a very very tight Build program because we had to move out of they had to move out of their existing premises at a certain time. So um, so that's, that's that was a decision that was made um, very early and we had your light on board. Um, it just was so logical because we if you did any other system you'd get a, you'd be getting thermal bridges everywhere so and it's also easy to do roof penetrations and waterproof them and it's basically bulletproof so um, that decision was made and the existing roof as you can see from the from the oval shot there had a whole lot of different roof levels um, so we just um, wrapped the wrapped the neuro wrapped the, the neural light and the thermal, uh, thermal insulation up up the walls and up the walls where the, out the steps and then over the whole roof. So we had a um, completely external envelope insulated, which um, made life really easy for us. Um, and and um, yeah, the other advantage is, is we had to do some new penetrations at a, at a, at a later time, and um, it was easy to do. We, you know, we, had, we added a recording studio on, we had to get new air and stuff into it, and we just made a hole and, and did it, so it was quite easy. So um, the, the metal tray roof meant that there had to be some packing uh, in the bottom of the tray at the, at the fixing points, uh, which the, um, the contractor did quite easily, didn't seem to have any problem. So um, it was all about um, just making it, making the thermal envelope, reusing the existing building, keeping the existing structure. Uh, we also, the uh, auditorium roof itself was done under a different system. It was an Australian Jura panel, um, prefabricated um, roof, which the same as used on this on the on the convention set of roof at Court Fire. We had a metal, we put a metal roof on that because we could put a greater roof pitch on it. Um, we also in the auditorium had um, crosslam, all made of crosslam uh, timber from uh, New Zealand crosslam, which has now gone to Australia, unfortunately. Um, <clears throat> so that and all the stairs were um, crosslam here. Air stairs, which were all prefabricated and craned into place. Um, we've got LED lighting throughout the project, and all this stormwater, because it's on a volcanic um, base, uh, we will manage to uh, soak on site. Um, our filter obviously filter first and then soak on site. So there's quite a few sustainable issues that we dealt with. Um, so, so um, Glenn, that, that's excellent overview. Have you, is this like a one-off project for you or have you done similar kind of uh, renewal of buildings in the past? Um, I have done, yeah, I've done quite a few churches put into industrial buildings. Um, 
and before we had a decent warm roof system, we would basically just put a suspended ceiling in and put the insulation in there, which was which was not good because you get all these thermal bridges. So um, this is a system that uh, probably I used for the first time on, on this sort of job, but it just makes so much sense that um, if, it, you know, if I ever do any more churches uh, in industrial buildings, I'd certainly use it again. Um, because well, yeah. of, you, you should become our sales rep. Uh, yeah, but a lot of the teachers are going to have to go to industrial buildings now. It makes sense to reuse them because they have, usually have a good height and you need height for acoustics. And um, there's so many objections in residential areas that um, churches tend to go um, tend to be going to commercial areas now. So. Okay. Well, that's, I mean, that's a classic example of a low hanging fruit. Um, Scott, do you want to spend a couple of minutes just running through uh, a warm roof builder? Yeah, sure. Look, I'll keep it reasonably um, brief there, John. So one point that Glenn touched on there was the pitch of the existing roof, so being 1.5 degree. Obviously, that's a, a good pitch for the Neurotherm warm roof system. Um, we code mark certified down to 1 and 84. Um, situations where you've got an existing roof less than that pitch, we actually have you can see in that render there, now that render is based on a, a, an image that was taken during construction on the site there. And you can see the, the layer of branded board there. Now that's Enotherm PIR, which is the insulation board. Now that can be pre-supplied with a, a one degree pitch already preset into that board. So situations where you might have quite a, a flat old roof one way of overcoming that is using the, the taper board approach. Obviously, Glenn, on, on this project, there was no issue. It was a, a flat board approach. Um, you can see there that the, the metal tray is exposed. Now, obviously, one key thing there is we need to make sure that the, the existing metal tray is structurally stable before the new system is installed. Now, that's typically carried out by a a licensed building practitioner or a suitably qualified individual. Um, the, the metal tray is, is washed using a, a special solution supplied by us. What that does is that just cleanses any mould. Um, any rust in the build up there obviously needs to be tackled before the new system is installed. In terms of the actual build up of the new system, you can see some white segments there. Now that's an expanded polystyrene, which is it's simply there to act as a, a cavity infill um, between those seams. And what that does is it provides you with a, a relatively flat base to then install the new system because the, the Enotherm board is, when it's installed, it's installed in a, a brick bond sort of pattern. So all the joins are offset. So by infilling those negative details in the profile, that provides you with a, a bit of a buffer to stop the board from bending. The next layer that you can see in there, there's a, a dedicated vapor barrier. That's the, the Neuroply ALU vapor barrier. Once that's installed, all of the joints, they're overlapped, and that provides you with a, an airtight, watertight layer, which is obviously key for a warm roof system there. That just helps to control any any moisture that might be in the building. The next layer there, as I talked about, is the the Enotherm PIR insulation board. Now that's a it's a very lightweight product. It has excellent fire performance. Um, in terms of the compressive strength, look, it has a very high compressive strength. And in terms of the the thermal performance. Um, Glenn, I believe it was 70 mil that was used on the Life Church, is that correct? Yes, yes, yes. We originally had, um, had it at 100, but it was just a, a cost consideration that it was reduced, but it was still suitable for your climate. Yeah, so in terms of comparing to other types of insulation, it has a very high performance. So at 70 mil, it offers a, an R value of 3.15. Uh, 100 mil will offer an R value of 4.5. One key aspect of that is the insulation layer, like Glenn talked about, is continuous. So you don't have any thermal breaks in the system, which means thermally it's, it's very efficient as opposed to a, 
traditional lofted type insulation fitted between rafters. And you can see there's some little wee uh, blue dots there. Now they're a, a mechanical fixing, again, part of our system, part of the Neurolite system. And that's a, a thermally broken fastener that's fixed through the board, through the vapor barrier, and then into the substrate below. So that whole system is mechanically secured Look, it offers. I've got um, I've got a question come in about that actually, um, Scott. Yeah, um, sure. Is the anatherm and polystyrene board suitable for to be trafficable, or are special walkways needed? Um, look, it's suitable for light maintenance traffic, but yeah, look in terms of if there's going to be a high degree of of traffic, then we definitely recommend a, a subsidiary system just to stop the board from being damaged. But look, the board itself is extremely robust. So, I mean, in terms of the installation process, look, there's going to be a lot of activity there. And the board having high compressive strength is pretty unaffected. But hey, like anything, if you were to drop a toolbox on it, mm. it's going to ding it. So, And um, I've got another question here. This one's actually for Kate. Because we've got about two more minutes to go in the presentation. We like to run it really uh, tight. Um, Kate. Do you find that clients start the carbon conversation or, or do you have to do it? And if it's you, how, how do you bring it up? Um, it's actually been really interesting. I've worked in this space um, for a bit over 10 years and certainly um, for, for the majority of that time, um, it was me that needed to bring up those conversations. The last couple of years, um, carbon has just become such a hot topic and um, you know we've, we're getting um, clients coming to us uh, you know more and more saying you know we really need to understand our emissions um, I think before that and and with clients that aren't ready for that space we really talk a lot in the risk space you know um, uh, carbon emissions and, and unsustainability is becoming a really high risk um, for businesses um, for directors um, as well as for the environment okay other uh, question I actually this is what I'd spend the night doing, I read the government's document, Building for Climate Change, and I, they'd actually don't even consider uh, re upgrading buildings as a, as a desirable path. They think that we can solve climate change by new buildings only. Well, what do you think about that, Kay? Is that the document that just came out about yeah. a week ago? Yeah. I've actually caught, caught up with a few people, and I, and I think it's, it's not, um, I, I'm not sure that that's, the view. Um, the, I think there's more challenges in mandating uh, the upgrading of existing buildings than there are in mandating new builds. There's a lot of mechanisms and levers you can pull in the new building space that, that don't exist in, in uh, existing buildings. Um, and it's really interesting to look overseas and see some of the other mechanisms um, that there have been. But um, you know, I think that's going out for stakeholder engagement. And I'm certain that there's going to be a lot of um, uh, effort in upgrading existing building stock as, as well. Yeah, well, I, I, I hope so because uh, I think this is, this is a challenge that we have to pull on every lever. It's like uh, yes. fighting the pandemic by uh, uh, you know taking half measures. So um, excellent. Um, look, we're now at uh, ten fifty nine, so we've got one minute to go. I've got a couple of polls that we want to do before we wrap things up. Um, Firing up the first poll is just a quick, um, uh, you know, how did you find the presentation? Um, so if you can um, give us our feedback so that we can always keep refining things. Um, while we do that, um, I'd just like to thank um, Glenn and Kate for their participation. It's been a, a really good exercise. Um, for me, it's about raising people's awareness and having that carbon discussion and continue to have that carbon discussion. So I'm really pleased to be able to feature a project that um, often I think the building renovation jobs uh, fly yeah. under the radar. And so we were keen to just highlight a really successful project to you. Well, thanks for having us, John. Keep up the good work. Thank you very much. Thanks, John. Um, we've got one more poll. <laughs> Um, and that's just for anyone who wants a follow-up, just uh, click that and we will um, give you a call if you want, uh, you know, a bespoke presentation, we'll come and see you. We've also got coming up a couple of presentations. Um, we've got a mystery one, 
in two weeks time, which is, um, we don't expect many people to show up to a mystery one, but we will be announcing it via email when we launch a new product system. And then um, following that, we've got, um, well, what have we got? Oh, livable space. So that one actually is uh, looking at um, how, to, how to make your building a livable environment on the roof. And then we're going to have a product one, which is looking at penetrations and fixing. So we're going to kind of get down into some real detail. Uh, that one there is a solar panels that were just added onto the um, Vibe Event Centre, which we, we, uh, we've been doing over the last few months. So yeah, go onto the education page and register if you're interested in any of those presentations and we'll be um, look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks. Thanks very much, everyone. Thanks, see you later.